Well, it's my privilege to introduce um, our CEO, Kenneth Davis, who, uh, as he did last year, I'm sure will summarize in a very uh, succinct and challenging way for us to move forward. Ken? Thank you, Scott. And I don't know if I'm going to be as succinct and challenging as I was last year. This is a tough group. This is a tough conference. Uh, last, yesterday in the evening, after my third granddaughter was born, um, I had nothing to do with it. Um, I had to meet with the Board of Trustees, and there I was summarizing what we're doing to integrate the Continuum Hospitals with Mount Sinai. That was an easier task than summarizing the last day and a half here. Um, but in 15 minutes, I'm going to give it a try. And what I really want to focus on is the ecosystem that I think supports team science. And to talk about that ecosystem, to understand the attributes that we need to facilitate innovation, because ultimately these conferences, last year's, this year's, and hopefully for years to come, is all about facilitating innovation. So I'm going to talk about that ecosystem at a number of different levels. I'm going to talk about it at the NIH, at the medical school, at the team that does science, the group membership, and then the leaders of the group. And I'm going to do it from a personal history, from a case study, if you will. Um, and it begins in a funny place at a funny time. It begins in 1977, when probably half this room wasn't even born. Um, and it's a story that's very different from SEALs landing in Somalia. It's about investigators landing in the Bronx. Um, but there were similarities. And the similarities were those SEALs have their life at risk, and these investigators had their careers at risk. And here's how the story happened. Um, my wife and I were both at Stanford at that time. She was an endocrine fellow. I was a career development scientist with the VA, having finished my residency, and working on uh, how neurotransmitters interacted, mostly interested in how cholinergic systems and dopaminergic and noradrenergic systems all interacted to produce psychiatric disease. Um, and she was interested in the neuroendocrine window and what it might teach us about psychiatric disease. And at that time at Stanford, where we were, given um, the culture, the economy, and the policies of the institution, as well as the psychiatry department that I was in, um, it was clear that there was very little room for advancement of very young people. And we needed to leave if we were really going to build up a laboratory. Um, so we began to look for jobs. And uh, this had been a place that I knew because I had been a medical student here. Um, and they began to talk to me about would I come back to Mount Sinai. And we began to talk about this possibility. And ultimately it led to, well, you know, there's this psychiatry service at the Bronx VA. And even though I was only 31, maybe I could run the psychiatry service at the Bronx VA. It seemed possible. And then Roz Yalow wins the Nobel Prize. Roz Yalow was from the Bronx VA. She was a member of the Mount Sinai faculty. But fundamentally, she saw herself as a scientist at the Bronx VA. Her collaborator had been Saul Burson, um, who died when I was a medical student in the fourth year of medical school here. So it was a research-driven VA, we thought. It won the highest number of awards that a VA had ever won. It was the Middleton Award. There had been more Middleton Award winners from the Bronx VA than any other VA. Had a Nobel Prize winner. Had laboratories. We thought this was maybe going to work. Um, but I knew I needed to build a team and bring people there. So I began to talk to my colleagues at Stanford. And um, a psychologist who was a brilliant psychologist who was finishing his fellowship named Richard Mose, he said, he come. And the chief resident was an MD, PhD, named Mike Murphy. He said, he come. And I knew Bonnie was going to come. We needed a neuroendocrinologist as the work we were doing. And we recruited a, a neurochemist to run the GCMS. Um, and a whole bunch of other people ultimately came. Amazingly, none of them visited the Bronx VA beforehand. And this is the time, the late 70s, early 80s, when the Bronx was burning. This was really bad. This was a time when the VA was being lambasted for the quality of care 
it was providing. And I didn't even know what was going on at that point until we arrived in the Bronx with this team. And the first day on the job, we learned that the equivalent of Jayco had been by to visit the psychiatry service and had put it on probation. And we were in charge of the whole service. Well, just as we were leaving Palo Alto, the National Institute on Aging had issued an RFP for program project grants. It was a new institute. They had issued no program project grants. Our group had just begun work that was demonstrating that if you increase cholinergic activity in the brain, you could improve memory. And we had written that this had important implications for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So with incredible audacity, this group of people all very young, committed to each other, began to write a program project grant. No one had even written an R01 in the whole group. No one had written an R01. We wrote the program project grant. It was the first one funded by the NIA. It was program project grant number one from the NIA, it wound up being funded for some 25 years thereafter, and it was all about the therapeutics of Alzheimer's disease. So we arrived at the Bronx with this group and with that grant, and the group became very productive. Um, the VA started a program called Schizophrenia Biological Research Centers. There were two named in the whole country. Again, our group was one of them. We had been there about a year. Uh, so you'd think that everything was going wonderfully. This is a terrific group. I'll talk about what I learned from it. But this is part of the reason I'm telling you the story. About two years into this, I get called into Roz Yallow's office. Roz is one of these heroines of science. And she says, I've been looking at these papers that your team keeps writing. I don't understand all these authors. How is it, she says, that you couldn't possibly have all these authors? And we have this long discussion that goes on for about 30 minutes, essentially questioning whether there was misconduct in our group because how could there be so many authors on these papers? And I would explain, well, you know, there's a, a guy, a neurochemist who runs the GCMS, and then there are the people who have to uh, identify the patients and sign them up and do all the psychometrics on the patients, and then there's the, the uh, internist who has to clear all the patients that they're medically able to take the drugs that we're going to give them. I go on and on, just shaking her head. You know, it just can't be. It just can't be. Me and Saul did everything. Me and Saul did everything. All those people in the back of the lab, they didn't count, right? They weren't part of the team. Um, so it's a very hard culture. And the culture uh, is obviously a lot easier today, but our group was the anachronism. It was the, we were the unusual group at science at Mount Sinai at that time. But we still needed other collaborators, because we were a group of psychiatrists who increasingly were dealing with neurological diseases. So I needed to recruit neurologists. Well, the chairman of neurology wasn't going to let any neurologists be hired by psychiatrists and credential them in psychiatry to do neurology. So we had to find other people, internist Paul Azen, who's now very famous in Alzheimer's disease, was an internist that we brought into our group. He just, all he was doing was clearing patients on the psychogeriatric unit um, to begin to work with us to fill the neurology void that we had because the structure of academic medicine at that time put such barriers around multidisciplinary work that we had to to go through all kinds of gyrations to pull this kind of team together. So what do we learn and what do I take away from that? Well, let me start with the NIH. We were fortunate our group was able to succeed because we got program project grants, we got Alzheimer's Disease Center grant, and we got Schizophrenia Biological Research Center grant. And we had all those three big interactive, multidisciplinary center grants, I think before almost anybody had an R01. I think that tells us something about team building and R01s. I think the degree to which NIH has to go before Congress and count how many R01s they have so that the members of the House and the Senate subcommittees 
all think that they're being robust and lots of people are distributing, incomes being distributed to lots of people, is counter to team building. Um, obviously, at the NIH, limited budget and sequestration hurts us a great deal in being able to be innovative and to build teams. But we talked a lot in this conference about accepting failure. Um, but all of us who've written successful grants know that when you write that work conducted to date section, particularly in an era in which seven to 10% of grants are funded, that you practically have to lay out the blueprint for success that mostly has been done. So that the NIH is one of the last places that is able to accept failure. And we're gonna have to do a lot better in communicating that fact to the NIH and taking risks. Because the grants that we fund are notoriously conservative and not innovative because they have to be the 93rd percentile. What about structure? Structure of the medical school I already spoke to. When we were trying to build teams and departments and the medical school were really silos and joint appointments were a rarity, that was destructive. And thanks to our brilliant dean, we have more institutes and centers than I can keep track of. And that's really great because it encourages us to be multidisciplinary and to have multiple academic appointments. I don't even know how many departments Dennis is a member of. I lost track too. Same thing with Nestler. But it goes on and on, and that's appropriate because that's what modern science has got to be about. And we have to keep, keep doing that. But of course, it produces a complex matrix structure because it's no longer hierarchical. The medical school isn't hierarchical. The ecosystem here is not hierarchical. The ecosystem is a matrix. Not everybody works well in a matrix. And I think we have to recognize that and accept the fact that in modern medicine, particularly in innovative places like this that are gonna be on the cutting edge, not everybody fits. In one of the sessions, we was talked about team blockers that there can be no team blockers. And I think that's the case. There can be no team blockers. Um, and it is up to leadership to be able to say that's unacceptable and you either become someone who can accept matrix management or you leave. Let's talk about team members. What do we know about team members? Well, our teams, when I was leading our teams, our teams got along together. We played softball together, we went to Chinatown together, we did a lot of things together. I think that built up trust among people and I think trust is really essential for people to be able to work effectively in teams. Because these teams with really good scientists can be inherently competitive. And the competition can be destructive to ultimately putting together the kinds of large program projects and centers and collaborative research that I think is so essential to really be innovative. It requires people who can truly be unselfish, who can be somewhat altruistic, who don't have to take all the credit. Those people we also should recognize there's not in everybody. Um, Navy SEALs talked about what to do with egos. We have the same problem in science. And he said he would rather have A minuses and B pluses than a triple A. Sometimes that's the case in science too. Sometimes the superstar isn't gonna be able to work well in the group and that's too bad. Um, so we need people who are unselfish. We need people who feel empowered. If we're going to have a multidisciplinary structure, everyone comes because they bring a special knowledge to the table. Those people have to feel that they can really exercise that knowledge and they're not being second guessed by everybody else around them. What about the leaders? What do the leaders have to show? Well, obviously the leader has to know who's gonna to put together in the group, but I think a leader has to be encouraging a leader has to set expectations, has to be inclusive, has to be able to share, has to have that altruism, has to not be able to take credit all the time, has to be able to go into the background, doesn't have to be the first or last author on every paper. Um, 
really needs to understand that you're facilitating the careers of a group that may have to stay together for years, if not decades, and everybody's got to succeed for that to happen. It's got to be able to build camaraderie. But one of the things that I think it was Dr. Koenig said, which I think was so brilliant, thank you for saying this, was that driving innovation is encouraging subversion. I love that. Driving innovation is encouraging subversion. And how do you encourage subversion in a team that's doing science? I think it's important that we allow the free flow of ideas, allow people to challenge each other, and that produces an inherent tension um, because somebody's ideas are going to win. And if somebody else's idea loses, they may feel that they're not valued in the group. So we've got to facilitate that free for exchange of ideas without making it competitive and even punitive for those who aren't the winners. But encouraging subversion to facilitate innovation, I think, is really a critical part of, these, of, of a good team. And then we talked about it, we have to allow failure, and clearly we do. But I'm going to end on this note. The people who organized this conference, Scott Friedman, Anatine Lyons, Dennis, um, Jeff Smith, of course, didn't fail. They didn't fail. They succeeded. And they didn't accept failure in this, and I'm very glad they didn't, because they put together a great conference, and we all owe them a round of applause. Thank you. And thank you all for attending. <laughs>